Let's pray, church. Father, what a gift it is to come together as your people. Um, Lord, what a privilege to come every single Sunday. How desperate we are to meet with you, God. How desperate we need to just be enfleshed with one another. We are your body. We need the encouragement of one another. We need to sing over one another. We need to sit alongside one another as we take in the word, as we respond to the word, as we gather for fellowship later. This is so life-giving to our souls, Lord. And for those who come and they don't quite see that, or those who come and they don't quite fit yet, Lord, would you help immerse them into the body? Would you keep our eyes, those who are here and home at this church, just eyes just looking for people that may still feel that kind of, man, on the outside sort of vibe? Lord, we want to welcome them in. We want to invite them in. We're so grateful for the people, Lord, that you have brought into your house today. And now, God, I pray that um, as the word of God is preached, your word, Lord, establishing your authority over this church, that you would speak to the hearts of those who come today, that you would open the eyes of the spiritually blind, that you would revive the hearts of the spiritually dead, that you would, for those of us who are in Christ and spiritually alive, that you would challenge us, that you would encourage us, that you would help us to rightly divide and apply the word of truth. We recognize, Lord, that all that comes by the power of your Holy Spirit, which we would ask, Lord, that he would be pleased to move in our midst, to take the word and make it truly effectual in lives. That it would come in power and in demonstration of his work. We ask for this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Church, I see you leaning. Grab your Bibles. You know what we're doing. And if you're new with us, you're just going to stay standing for the reading of God's word as we come to Luke chapter 6. Actually, the end of Luke chapter 6 today. Uh, You're going to see why this is a pretty fitting text (laughs) coming out of the last weekend. Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 46, and I'll read to verse 49. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But... The one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. May the Lord write its eternal truths on your hearts. You can be seated. Church, so good to be together. Amen? Amen. So good that even after Easter weekend, we gather the next weekend. Isn't that a good thing? I know sometimes it can feel like you come and you're like, man, I just, all my energy went out last weekend, right? And I preach a bunch of times and all my energy goes out last weekend, but I am glad to be back. I am delighted that the Lord gives us this every single week and we need it every single week. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's not forget this, even as we're enjoying kind of maybe the high of what last weekend was for so many of us. Well, my name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor here. It is a joy to have you with us. If you are new, Pastor Chris already said welcome, and we'll get you all connected and all that stuff, but I'd love to meet you as well. If you want to do that after the service, I'll be in the lobby. would love to say hi to you and connect and see if I can help get you plugged in in some way, whatever I can do to make that happen. Uh, In the meantime, Luke chapter 6. We're in the book of Luke. We're doing this series through the whole book called Looking to Jesus. And it's just that every single week we get to look to Jesus. We, get, we need that. We need that on a repetition in our lives. And, uh, and so we're getting that week in and week out. And we come to the end of Luke chapter 6 today. 
And the title of the message is The Crux of Christian Discipleship. The Crux of Christian Discipleship. I don't believe there's any accidents, right, in the sense of like we just happen to, this isn't just a coincidence of a text today, we happen to fall on this text. I think this text is an extremely fitting post-Easter text. Can you see why? Let me just say something, church, that we should celebrate. Last weekend was the highest attended weekend in our church's history. We have never had more people in our church ever in the history. Isn't that awesome? And we celebrate that, right? We don't have that attitude like, man, I couldn't get a seat. I hope they don't come back next week. We don't say that, right? We don't say that. We don't feel that. I think there are some Christians, though, as the church gets big, it's like, man, it's going to ruin my church. You're going to ruin my church. No, they're not. No, they're not. And we're glad that they hear the gospel, right? And we aren't changing to try to get more people to come back. In fact, I'm just going to preach this text and this will do the job, right? And so we have to celebrate the fact that multitudes, more than ever in the history of our church, came to hear Jesus Christ proclaimed. They actually got the gospel last week, right? And I trust you guys got fed as well. It's not the same message on repeat that you got as a fourth grader, that you never hear anything different. And so you're like, I kind of come to church on Easter because I'm supposed to, but I can't wait for the next week. We don't do that here right? We just jumped into the text. We got after it. The gospel was preached, but hopefully your hearts were encouraged as well. But we have to admit there is this kind of cultural phenomenon around Easter and around Christmas, right? Like we even have names for it, okay? We're not that church though that says these names out loud in a snarky way. But you know what I'm talking about, right? There are names for the crowd that come only on Easter's and Christmas. Do you know some of them? It's like CEOs, right? We don't use those in a snarky way, but we've probably heard Christmas, Easter onlys, right? Or maybe you've heard of creasters. All right, and if you're that, no judgment here. I just simply say out there in the Christian world, there's these terms that are going on. I, I found one this week. I thought that was kind of interesting, and I, I'll be honest, I laughed a little bit. Uh, submarine Christians, because they only surface a few times a year. Yeah. Now, this, is, this isn't us. This isn't our right, church. Tell, tell your neighbor, this isn't us. This isn't what we do. This isn't the snark that's coming from us, but there's a recognition that there's kind of a phenomenon around Easter and Christmas. It's when you just get floods of people in the doors. But guess what? There's terms for the people on a regular basis that come to church. You know what that term is? Sunday Christian. Right? You are a Sunday Christian. You act the part, you do the thing one day a week and the rest of your life you live like, well, we know the word, however you want to live. We have this category and we're living in a time, maybe more than ever, although it is disappearing, more than ever in the history of the world is there this category that lives especially in our culture and I think it's still alive and well very much in our culture is this cult category of nominal Christian which is Christian in name only. Someone who professes, I'm a Christian, I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. They'll even say that. They'll profess they're a Christian, but in their practice, they're in no way consistent with anything that looks Christian on a regular basis. Okay, can I just confess to you something? Like, I don't think churches have helped with this. I think in some ways, churches have actually uh, aided this devolving into this nominal Christianity. And I think, I, I want to just say that I think a lot of churches that aid in this mean well. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Like they want to reach people, but in order to reach the world, they become so much like the world, they end up falling in with the world and are actually no heavenly good for people that need Jesus. But we don't judge them that their heart's not in it. Their heart wants to reach people. They're just reaching people in a way that compromises the gospel into kind of easy believism where it becomes about, man, if we could just get them to accept Jesus, we get them to, we just seal the deal, right? If we can get them to raise their hand, then they're good to go. And even if we don't say that, we often mean that. And here's the thing, superficial Christianity is great for stats, 
And superficial Christianity is great to build crowds. You can build big crowds off of superficial Christianity. You can even, with superficial Christianity, make it through a a few trials in life, right? You can take a little nugget from chicken soup for the soul kind of Christianity and make it through some trials. Have you done it before? But that kind of Christianity will not make it through the judgment because that's when your faith will be shown for the substance it really has. And that's the point that Jesus is talking about today. So jump with me into Luke 6 for a second. And as we go, go back a few verses because I kind of want to show you that Jesus had his own Easter kind of crowds going on. Like the Sermon on the Mount was well attended, right? Look at verse 17. It says that gathered around Jesus were what? Great crowds of his disciples, okay? Let's just for fun, let's just say that's the normal Sunday crew, okay? Right? Great crowds of his disciples. Who are you? You're a mixture of the committed, right? Some of you less committed, some of you more committed, some of you newer to the faith, some of you older to the faith. This is normal Sunday attendance people. Let's go with that. But the Easter crowd's the next part, right? It's the great crowd of disciples and a great, what? Multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and around the seacoast, right? Isn't this the kind of crowds that come on Easter? It's the disciples, and then it's all your family, all your friends, right? Everybody you can get to come. You'll even reach out to people from out of state because so-and-so's getting baptized, and you just get them all here on Easter. Doesn't it have that kind of vibe that the Sermon on the Mount has? Now, should we celebrate that so many people heard the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus? Can we be that church that just thanks God for that? Let's celebrate that, absolutely. But Jesus' own sermon ends with this heart-searching warning about the danger of professing a Christian faith without a consistent practice of a Christian faith. Guys, and it's such a serious warning that J.C. Ryle, in his commentary, said it like this. He said, the open sin people, right? The ones that are just in avowed unbelief. They don't believe in Christianity. They don't claim to be a Christian. They're clear as crystal. He goes, that for sure has slayed its thousands. But listen to this. But profession without practice slays its tens of thousands. He he goes, you got people all over the place who go, I'm not a Christian, I don't apologize for that, and I'm clear about it. I'm not a Christian. Slays its thousands, right? You'll stand before the living God, right? That's a scary thing. What he's saying is there's going to be far more, surprisingly so, who claim the name of Christ and are among the tens of thousands. So Jesus is going to say there's two types of people those who obey Jesus' words and those who don't. And only one of those is a true disciple of Jesus. Can you guess which one? It's the one who obeys Jesus. Here's the big idea for this morning. The crux of Christian discipleship is obedience. How tough is that, man? You're like, oh, this is awkward. This is going to be a heavy sermon because I got those people that actually liked your sermon on Sunday, Pastor Scott. And I was so nervous. I was sitting there just going, God, please don't let them say anything dumb. Please don't let them say anything dumb. Please don't let them say anything dumb. Oh, they they want to come back. They're here. And what are you doing today? Jesus didn't seem to apologize for the fact that he had crowds and crowds and crowds of people and he wants you to know a real disciple of me, a real disciple of Jesus is one who is obedient. The crux of Christian discipleship is obedience. Now, for those of you who are like, wait, 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 wait. Are you saying that people enter the kingdom because of their, dis- or, or because of their obedience? Because of their own obedience? No, I'm not saying that Anyone will enter the kingdom because of their own obedience. We know that's not true. But I'm also saying it's equally true that no man enters who is not obedient. Or you flip it like this. 
Let me say it another way. It's true that you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But that faith bears fruit in your life because that faith is a living faith and that life can't help but come out of you in the form of truly joyful, willing, loving obedience to your Savior. Obedience that's not for life. You're not trying to gain it. You obey enough and it turns something on, but obedience as the proof of life that you have in Jesus Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, okay? So that's what I'm meaning. It is the fruit of a faith. Do you have this kind of obedience? So let me start with a point of substance and then we'll go with two questions and that's the whole message, okay? A point of substance and two questions. Here's the point. Number one, discipleship implies lordship and lordship demands obedience. You're like, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? It means you're a disciple. What does being a disciple mean? It means you have a new Lord, okay? Previously, before you came to Christ, you still had a Lord, but, but go ahead, tell yourself who was Lord. I was Lord. I did things my way. I ran my own little K kingdom, right? You were Lord. When Jesus steps into your life, right? When you receive Jesus by faith, he becomes Lord. Discipleship implies lordship. And because he's Lord, that means there's a new obedience to give to that new Lord. Discipleship implies lordship and lordship demands obedience. Let me show you this in the text. Verse 46. What a question to end the Sermon on the Mount. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? <laughs> Could you imagine that Easter service? <laughs> the suburbs would melt down, right? Any, put Jesus in any big church in the suburbs, and I think there'd be like the like hyperventilating, well, what did he just say? You're steering the crowds away. You're making them not want to come back. How Jesus, how dare you? You need some public speaking lessons. You need some PR help. Don't you want to build the kingdom? You have the biggest crowds you've seen in your ministry thus far to speak to them, and you're going to speak like this? You're going to go, hey, here's what it looks like to be, here's what the kingdom-bound people look like. Here's what their lives look like. And oh, by the way, why stop calling me Lord if you don't actually do what I tell you? I can't even, I would just, oh, so many emails, info at Doxa Church. That pastor that you had on Sunday was so rude. I can't, what audacity he had. I think we'd melt down. Maybe not, maybe not our church, right? Maybe most of us were like, yes, give it to us, right? But I'm telling you, the suburbs would melt down at the preaching of Jesus on Easter. They would think he butchered it. And you'd be apologizing to your friends or trying to explain how it's normally different. So let's not get so comfortable with like suburban Christianity that we don't let Christ just speak for itself. Sometimes for me as a preacher, I'm just thankful to let Christ speak for himself. Because it gets me out of the rat race of kind of the, I don't know, the cultural vortex of suburbanized Christianity that tries to suck you in. I don't know if anyone else relates to that, but I think it seems to be that one of the things Jesus is saying is that it's easy to say you believe in Jesus. I think a lot of people think my friends are Christian because they say they believe in Jesus. They'll even say Jesus is their Lord and Savior. They'll even say they believe Jesus died on the cross for their sins. Does that make you a disciple? It's certainly true. And then it gets confusing. You're like, I, th I think so. I think so. I think what Jesus is saying here is it's easy to call him Lord, but just to merely call him Lord actually means nothing. 
I think this throws the crowd for a loop, right? When you, when you think about the crowd, n- not only as would be assumed, would it be that those who don't confess Jesus as Lord are not true followers. We get that, right? If someone's just going, listen, Jesus is not my Lord. He's not Lord. You're like, all right, not a follower. What I think that throws the crowd for a loop is the fact that he says that there will be some who do say Jesus is Lord who are not true followers. In fact, the other time, one of the other times, Lord, Lord is used is in Matthew 7. Do you remember that text? That text is freaky. Matthew 7, verse 21 says it like this, not everyone who says to me, ready, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I'm going to declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Again, you see the problem, right? The problem is you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say. Put simply, we could say it like this. He, he, Jesus is not your Lord if you are not doing what he says. Whew. Happy Easter, everyone. Get your gift on the way out. We've got still iPads, I think, going out in the cafe. We got iPads. We got two iPads. All right. Woo! What's crazy about this is like anything less than doing what Jesus tells you is a problem. Right? So the church has all kinds of people filled with people discussing Jesus and his words. We have people analyzing Jesus and his words. We have people debating Jesus and his words. We have people discussing Jesus and his words. We have people all over the church who admire Jesus and his words. We have people who appreciate Jesus and his words. But the bottom line is it, all of that is a problem if you're not ultimately doing Jesus' words if you're not putting into practice the word of God, anything less, whether admiring or discussing or praising or debating, all of it is a problem if it doesn't issue forth in doing in your life. Do the word. I remember this about promise keepers. One of the first events, you know I didn't grow up in a, my mom was Christian, my dad wasn't. You guys know the story, I think, for the most part. Got invited by some friends, and first of all, totally embarrassed by Christianity. Utterly, completely embarrassed. These guys, promise keepers, wow, it was lame. It was so lame. I'm just going to say it. Maybe that's why it stopped. I'm not sure. The idea was good, okay? Godly men being raised up. Yes and amen. But oh my goodness, there was a Christian culture that was super hardcore cringe to a junior high kid trying to be cool. All right? But one of the things I felt was just this utter fakeness that came out of people who schmoozed up a storm during the conference and I knew went back and lived a shady life on the the day to day. And I had a problem with that. I'd rather not brag about it on a Sunday and go home and actually live for Jesus, right? Did anyone feel that self-righteous anger at some point in their life? I mean, I remember that as a 14-year-old boy. I remember just looking and going, man, you're putting on such a show right now. You don't live like this at home. I've seen the way you act. I've seen the things you do. And I was 14 years old witnessing that. I'd rather just be quiet and go about my business or think about the camps they used to go to as a kid, right? Every kid got saved times a billion when they went there, man. They'd build that huge bonfire and they're like, speaking of hell, and then they sh- show you this thing and it's like flames 35 feet in the air. Every kid raises their hand. By the last night, they're just shooting up in worship like this. I mean, they're so excited and they go home and they live the same tragic life that they had lived before. Anything less than doing Jesus' words is a problem. It's really this issue of we have a lot of fans around Jesus, 
but he's concerned about the followers of Jesus. James 1 even said, you're going to have this in your midst. Expect this idea that you're going to have people who deceive themselves. In what way? They're going to deceive themselves because they're going to come and act and be around the Christian church. They're going to seem Christian. And yet they're going to deceive themselves because they're going to be hearers of the word only and not doers of the word. They may, may even leverage Jesus. This is where it gets tough in our day because I think Jesus is kind of added on as another like life coach. So it could be like, man, yeah, I'm Christian. I listen to Jesus' words all the time. But what you really do is you have this kind of way of living. I'll call it an enlightened self-interest. Okay. And so what you do is you'll, you'll pull from this and you'll pull from that. Man, I heard a great talk, a TED talk, and so I pulled from that. And you know what? I read a little Jesus today. I'm going to throw that in my back pocket. I like when Jesus said, love your enemies. That's good. It's going to help at work. And you just kind of, boop. So I'm Christian as well. I listen to Jesus' words too. Now, you probably don't listen to all of Jesus' words in that context, right? You're probably picking and choosing and all that stuff, and that's what we do. And, and so it can come off like you're Christian because you have some, like, what can Jesus do for me sort of mentality. You're still Lord, but if Jesus helps you be a better Lord, then awesome. Versus the kind of life that says, Jesus is Lord, and my entire life is lived in obedience to him. It's different. Both can masquerade, or both can, can show, but only one is the true substance. And the question is, which life are you living? All right, which, which life are you living? You have Jesus on the mount as the new Moses giving new revelation. And just as with the old covenant revelation given by Moses, it issues and ends with covenantal warnings, which Jesus is giving right now. He gives this warning in the form of a story. Because stories embed themselves into our hearts and minds in this way. And he gives this picture, okay? Two men, two houses. One withstands the flood. One crumbles in ruins. From the outside, there may not even be much way to even see a difference in external appearance between one house and another. In other words, think about the idea that they both seem to be Christian. And here would be my category for that. From the outside, you look at two people and you go, man, they definitely seem to be a Christian. And then you find out 10 years later, they deconstruct their faith and walk away altogether and you're shocked, right? But isn't that just as surprising as the person you could have sworn was a Christian and then gets saved 10 years later and baptized when you thought they already had been and everything was already there? They can look the same on the outside, but... Something is different, and only the flood reveals the difference in the quality of the foundation. Let's talk about which one you are. Two questions, two illustrations, two pieces to a story. Is your life the house built on the rock? Or is your life the house built without a foundation? Okay? Now, just in case this gets confusing, you definitely want to be the first one. Okay? I don't know. Sometimes I get confusing. And it's hard to follow me. I get a little amped, say a lot of words without taking a breath. Okay? and that may lead you to be confused. I want you to go, I, I need to be in category this first one, okay? I know it's point two. Uh-oh, oh my goodness, it's gonna get confusing. You want the house built on the rock. Let's read it, verse 47. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke out against the house and could not shake it because it had been well built. This is the one you want. 
a life characterized by, listen, a lifestyle of hearing and obeying Jesus' words. Like your foundation is the word of God and you're building your life by hearing and obeying on top of that word. Now, I say lifestyle as a really important focus and emphasis. A lifestyle. Because Jesus is implying a lifestyle here. And you pick that up by his use of the present tense verbs. Comes, hears, and what's the last one? Does. Each one of those is in the present tense. And in the Greek, that speaks to a consistent, habitual, ongoing pattern of life. You could could add that habitual, consistent, ongoing to every one of those, right? Right? Everyone who habitually, consistently, and in an ongoing way comes to me, who habitually, consistently, and in an ongoing way hears, and habitually, consistently, and in an ongoing way does my word. He's like this, right? Not perfectly, but patterned in this direction. We're going to talk about that for the person that's just like, Lacking assurance of faith, right? You can fear, man, I'm I'm not this. I just, I disobeyed Jesus this week. I'm not talking about never disobeying Jesus. Sadly, sadly, well, the difference with a Christian and a non-Christian is that when a Christian disobeys Jesus, which they will, it breaks their heart. It's, the difference isn't the Christian obeys all the time and the non-Christian doesn't. No, the Christian can be just as big of a hypocrite, sadly at times, but it breaks their heart because they love the God who loves and saved them. Very different. But there's a depth here you can see, right? They dig deep. They don't settle for surface. They get the foundation deep. And I think of just even the way how how you should start your faith. Apparently, it starts with, you know, having this pattern of coming to Jesus, right? It starts with coming. He who comes And one of the things about coming to Jesus is you have to leave something in order to come to Jesus. And I think this is a a problem because a lot of times the way Christianity is sold is just however you are, wherever you are, bring it all with you and you come to Jesus. And there's truth to that, right? You, You do come just as you are to Jesus and you won't remain the same. That is true. But the idea is that if you're going to come after Jesus, it doesn't mean you can just fit Jesus in as an accessory in your life. That's what I'm talking about. Just add him in to everything else going on. You still have your life, but you keep him like in the passenger seat, if you will. You're still driving, right? The question is, have you left your old way of life? Or maybe better to ask for you, Christian, do you keep leaving your old way of life? Because to keep coming to Jesus is to keep leaving where you are apart from Jesus. In leaving your old way of life, have you believed yourself to be who Jesus says you are even in the Sermon on the Mount? Do you come back to this? Do you understand that your poverty and spirit? Do you see your sin for what it is before a holy God? And do you see that what you bring to the table is nothing more than a beggar has at best? You bring the sin that makes salvation necessary. That is your sole contribution. And do you Long for righteousness, knowing you lack it. Do you see and hunger and thirst and does it grieve you that both you are a sinner and you lack the righteousness that you need, that you want to emulate and you want to embody and you want to exemplify? But that grieving about the sin that you have and the lack of righteousness takes you to the point of entrusting yourself to God for mercy through Jesus Christ. You have entrusted yourself. You have cast your entire life upon the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That life for me, lived for me. That death died for me. I should have died that death. That resurrection purchase my new life, affirms new life in Christ for all those who trust in him. That's my life. And trusting yourself there. It starts there. Keep coming and keep leaving the old. That's first level obedience, right? Repent and believe the gospel. 
And then from there, issues forth a lifestyle from that saving faith of loving obedience to God. Hungry to dig deeper, hungry to grow in depth of the grasp of the gospel that you have, in depth of the grasp of the word of God unto obedience in your life. That's your deepest desire. Now, the dug deep thing is a big deal, right? Because it's something that doesn't show up in the second guy, but does in the first. He digs this deep foundation. Here's the thing with deep. I think here's the major thing with deep that separates the two. We could talk a lot about components of this, but, but the issue is deep costs more. Deep's harder. You ever dug a big hole? Like some of you dads, that's when you're like, I'm not a kid anymore. Right? Every vacation, your kids were like, so much energy, they're like excited, they're doing the doggy thing like this, and you're like, no way, on God's green earth. If I do that, I stay stuck there in this position. Like, I do not get up, right? Unless you have a massive shovel, not one of those plastic ones either. You know what I'm talking about? You go and you're like, oh, we didn't bring a shovel, and so you go to Kmart, I don't even know if they have Kmarts anymore, they did in Tahoe back in the day, and you'd go and you'd get the Kmart shovel and you'd get one solid scoop and it would snap, and then you're stuck going like this, right? And it's so much work to build a deep hole. But have you ever thought about those things in life that like, there's certain purchases you'll even make. I don't know if you found these like categories. I found them in my life where it's like, um, I'm willing to spend extra money up front to save me some pain later on. Right? Like, let, let me just give you a category. I know we don't walk in this here, but good winter clothing in a cold place. Okay, I'll give you one more specific to my life, a good mattress. Why would you hate yourself <laughs> and buy such a sucky mattress? I don't get it. You spend so much of your time in bed. Annie up, you cheap husband, <laughs> up front, and not have to pay the penalty later by severe back pain as your bed is indented like this. You're like, it's part of it, you know? And you're like, no, that's not how it's supposed to work. It's supposed to be flat. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah, and you can't get out of bed either, right? There's something about the cost up front to save you later on. It's the exact same thing with true Christianity. It is worth digging a deeper foundation. It's going to cost more up front, but it will endure when the flood of judgment comes. This is the point of all Jesus' talk about discipleship. We're going to get into Luke 14 eventually, and it's about count the cost count the cost, count the cost. Discipleship is a count the cost kind of thing. You give up your life. You lay it down. Friends, buy the good mattress. Buy it to the glory of God, right? Don't settle for superficial Christianity. this describe you? Are you this house? Is this your life built on the rock? Or is your the house the life, wow, your life the house built without a foundation? Is this you? And sadly, I think there are, there are many of these. Verse 49. But the one who hears and does not do them, do the words of Jesus, is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Should we talk about the meaning of flood for a second? First of all, it's a familiar picture they would have understood, okay? Hot, dry place, when rain came, it came. 
You know what I'm saying? Like raining cats and dogs. It would come and it would just fill the banks to the point that it would flood over the banks and it would just seep as far as it could reach, affecting anything in its touch. This was the picture. Now, hearing this from Jesus, there, there may have been several kind of pictures going on. First of all, there's the actual picture of the house and the waters and the physical dynamics. It's very possible that Jesus' contemporaries may have begun to hear a hint here about their own temple. Meaning that Jesus was warning the Jews, which he will continue to do, that their house will fall if they don't keep his words, which of course they don't, and their house does end up falling, and we see that as we go on in the book of Luke. But the ch- maybe the clearest picture is how the word flood or the word storm is used in Matthew, how that's used in the Old Testament of God's judgment. And so you think about it, Jeremiah 23, 19, Jeremiah 30, 23 uses this language. Behold, the storm of the Lord, wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. Isaiah 28, 17, hails will sweep away the refuge of lies and waters will overwhelm the shelter. Job 27, 13 uses the picture in the portion of a wicked man with God. He says, terrors will overtake him like a flood. In the night, a whirlwind carries him off. In Proverbs, they talk about the difference between the wicked who's overthrown and the righteous who stands. Proverbs 12, 7 says, the wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. Proverbs 14, 11 says, the house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright flourish. So just just go with me for a second. Assuming this is present in Jesus' mind, namely that the way flood and storm was used in the Old Testament of divine judgment, then here's the truly scary part about this warning. Whatever house you're building will not be truly clear until it's too late. Do you understand what I'm saying? Whatever house you're building will not be clear to you until it's too late. When the judgment comes is not the time to go, oops. And Jesus isn't afraid. Some some, some are like, this this is a fear tactic. Jesus is using a fear tactic. Yeah. Jesus is not apologizing for using fear to persuade someone. He wants your life to withstand the deluge of judgment that is coming on judgment day. He wants that for you. He's pleading with you. And because the moment you figure out what house you have, it's too late, he uses warning. Do you see how loving that is? Do you see why he's pleading with you now to make sure you know the house that you're building right now, the life that you're living? He didn't want you to be like talkative in Pilgrim's Progress. You read that book? It's like the second most famous Christian book in history behind the Bible, right? You probably read it in literature. There's this character called Talkative. Do you remember this guy? He's described as the guy who thinks that hearing and saying will make a good Christian. And thus he deceiveth his own soul. And this conversation going back and forth with talkative, it said that men shall be judged according to their fruits. The end of the world is compared to our harvest. And you know that men at harvest regard nothing but fruit. You don't celebrate at harvest. Remember that seed we planted? It's still there. (laughs) Right? You go after the what? The fruit. Obedience is the fruit of a true disciple's life. And so with that, I have three words of warning for you, and we'll be done. Three words of warning to the spotty Christian, to the morbidly introspective Christian, and to the box-checking one. Okay? 
Do I know what category you're in? Some of you, yes. Are you guaranteed to be one of these categories? Not necessarily. But if this helps, to the spotty Christian, man, do I see this as an issue. What do I mean by the spotty Christian? I mean the Christian stinter. Very, very, very common in the suburbs. What do I mean by that? Your Christian life is like bad stick shift driving. I'm sorry, I don't mean that rudely. I know that's offensive. You're going to have to probably explain to your friend. He didn't really mean to be offensive. No, I mean exactly what I'm saying actually right now. I thought about this illustration all week. Your Christian life is like bad stick shift driving, right? Just jolted forward. We're in, we're out. We're in, we're out. We go to church all week, every week of the month, and we will see you in six months after that. We are in, we are out, we are in. We serve and we don't serve. We burn out and we come back. Stalls and fits and jolts and starts and marginally committed to Jesus. This is, this is a lot of people. Fitting him in and around the activities of your life. This is a lot of people. Jesus is in your life. You're like, he's in my life, he's in my life. You're fitting him in and around your lifestyle and the activities of your life. Just look at your life. Is it consistent? Do you even come to church consistently, right? Is that the be all end all? Coming to church makes you Christian. Not coming to church is a serious problem, for the record. Does it make you a Christian? No, it shows that you are, though. Here's my question. Does your life scream Jesus as Lord or Jesus as accessory? That's the question. You have to figure that out. Your lifestyle reveals a lot about who's Lord in your life. And I think the majority of these, of our, of the people, at least that are around this greater area of the suburbs, I'll be like broad. This is the biggest category of problem. Second category, to the morbidly introspective. This is the soft-hearted, lacking assurance believer. Much softer word, much different word here. This is to the sweet saint who cares so much about wanting to honor the Lord, but you struggle to see past the holes in your holiness. That relate? So what happens is, because you're so aware, you're like, man, all I want to do is be obedient to Jesus and all I see are the ways that I'm not. All I see are the ways that I'm not. And so what can happen is, you can get stuck in what I call a guilt-ridden cycle of conscience-assuaging obedience. You feel so bad about being disobedient that you obey just to get the feeling of guilt off of you. And once you get that going again, the problem is, though, what happens is you, you can't perfectly obey the Lord. So then you are disobedient again. And then you get into this discouragement. And then you know that the only thing that kind of makes you feel better is when you start obeying again and it kind of assuages the guilt on your conscience. And so you just get in this cycle of begrudging obedience. And what can happen eventually is you just repulse the Lord altogether. You don't want anything to do with that God where you just feel so stuck. You're like, I can't do it. And I'm trying to earn my obedience through this way to get the guilt out of me, Lord. And he's like, you just said it. You got to go back to the gospel. You got to go back to Christ's love in you, then it's love out of you. You don't, you don't, you have your conscience cleansed. You have your guilt taken away. This is what Jesus does. And you live from that confidence And so for you, loved ones, go back to the gospel. Go back to the good news. Get the love of Christ for you in, apart from anything you've done. And out of the overflow of that love, let it motivate you forward. Because begrudging obedience speaks volumes about your Lord as well. And then finally this. To the box-checking Christian. This is maybe the most deceiving house because it looks Christian, but have you ever met the kind of person who's just more naturally obedient than someone else? Did you have one of these kids? One was just more obedient. They just towed the line better. Does that mean their heart is in the right place? It means as a parent, you feel dang good about yourself. 
You know, like, he's killing it, right? I have this own dynamic as a pastor with my pastor's kids, right? They're all PKs. Man, and one of them just can toe the line, can toe the line so well. The question is, what's driving your obedience? To the box-checking Christian, is it a hunger and thirst for righteousness? Is it a love for God to make what's true positionally of you in Christ true practically in your life? Do you see it connected to the gospel? Do you see wanting it to come full circle? I don't know where you fall into this, but my heart is that the Lord would challenge you, open your eyes to see where you can grow, and we can walk in this together, upholding one another's arms as we pursue a discipleship that truly costs something for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the gift of your word. Lord, we need this. We need your truth to permeate our lives. We need you to examine our hearts, even why we obey, Lord. We need you to get some of us back to the gospel, reminded of our love, excuse me, your love you had for us. We love because you first loved us. And Father, I pray that you would open the eyes of those who are walking in a kind of quasi-Christianity, calling them Lord, but not doing what you say. Father, bring a conviction that leads to a leaving of their old life and a coming to you and a living of a life of discipleship that is costly, knowing that you bore the ultimate cost for us and out of the overflow of that grace, we live for you, God, gladly, willingly, and out of love. Only you can do that, Lord. Only you can open eyes. I pray that you would. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.